Welcome back once again, everybody. It is time to do our final video for the course. Um, the final topic we're looking at here is going to be one-way analysis of variance. So it's abbreviated ANOVA testing. And what ANOVA testing is for is it's for testing to see if there's a difference between means with more than two populations. So three or more populations, we're checking. Technically, we're testing to see if the means are approximately equal. <clears throat> the null hypothesis is always going to be just that, that the means are approximately equal. So if we're looking at three populations, it would be mean one equals mean two equals mean three. To do this test, <coughs> excuse me, we do a, use a slightly different probability distribution called the F distribution. And like the chi-squared distribution, it is it starts at zero and goes up from there. It's always positive. And it's skewed to the right tail. It's stretched out on that right tail. And it's always going to be the rejection region is going to be on that right tail. So if we're looking at rejecting with a critical value, we would reject if the critical value, if the F statistic is greater than F critical. Or if we're looking at a P value, we would reject if the P value is less than alpha, of course. Just like the chi-squared and the T distributions, the exact shape of the S distribution depends on degrees of freedom. However, we're looking at two different numbers that are being combined to make this test statistic. <coughs> so we're going to have two different degrees of freedom. If we look at, um, go to our table of contents here and go to table um, A5 for the F distribution. Now you got to be careful here. Um, if you look at the top, if we go back a page, you can see this is F distribution, but it says for alpha equals 0 0.025. We want it to be alpha equals 0 0.05. So you got to go ahead. There's a separate table for each value of alpha. So make sure you have the table with the correct value of alpha. And you can see there's numerator degrees of freedom on top denominator degrees of freedom on the left side here. So you have to select the degrees of freedom and it'll get then where they intersect will be the critical value. And we'll look at that more in our examples here. <coughs> so the one-way analysis of errors or one-way ANOVA is a method of testing for three or more populations to see if their means are approximately equal. We do have to assume that they have approximately the same variances. Um, they don't have to be really close, but they can't be radically different. Um, remember the variance. Is just the standard deviation. Squared. So in other words, we're saying they have to have approximately the same standard deviation. We're looking at a one-way analysis of variance, which means we only have one variable that we are testing um, between the two, only one treatment that we are testing between the three, three or more populations we're looking at. There is a two-way analysis of variance, but for this class, we're not going to get into that. So our objective is we're going to use samples from three or more different populations, and we're going to test to see if they have approximately the same mean. So we have requirements, just like all of our other tests. First of all, we have to assume the populations all have approximately normal distributions. Most data is really close to that, so we should be good with that. Second, the populations have approximately the same variance or standard deviation. Now, again, we said that they, they don't have to be perfect, but they just should be relatively close. In other words, they just can't be too far apart. Um, we have the... Samples are simple random samples of qu quantitative data, so they are numerical data. And the samples are independent of each other. So the populations are completely independent. There's no overlap. There's no logical pairing between the samples or anything like that. And the different samples are from populations that are categor categorized in only one way. In other words, we're only separating the populations by one variable not by multiple variables. So in the one-way analysis of, test, uh, of variance, like we said, the null hypothesis is always going to be that all the means are equal. 
So we can test either using technology to find a p-value, or we can divide, find the p-value from uh, the table. Um, remember that just like with the t distribution and chi-squared distribution, the p-value from the table is going to be approximate. We can say it's between two numbers. We can't give it, usually in most cases, <coughs> we can't give an exact value of the p-value. We will look at for a couple of different uh, technologies for Excel and for um, StatCrunch, how to interpret those displays to get the p-value. There's also, so we'll reject the null hypothesis if the p-value is less than alpha. We will fail to reject the null hypothesis if the p-value is greater than alpha. Now we'll look at this a little bit more later, but a small p-value means a large test statistic. A large p-value means a small test statistic. Or an F statistic. So we'll use technology. We'll find, we'll, we'll do the standard display where we actually do the full display in Excel or in uh, StatCrunch. And then we'll look at how we could actually go about finding critical values and stuff using simple functions in Excel as well. So we're going to look at head injury criteria, an HIC measurement, which measures uh, the severity and likelihood of getting a head injury in a crash. And so we have taken samples here of 12 different accidents, or technically 48 different accidents, but 12 each from accidents that occurred where the drivers were driving a small car, 12 from drivers driving a mid-sized car, 12 from large cars, and 12 from SUVs. And we have that HIC, or head injury criterion score, for each of those accidents. So now if I were looking at this, I actually have copied this data into Excel right here. I'm going to insert a row here, or insert a column here. And the reason I'm going to do that is so I can label this. So N, there are some values that we have here. N is the size of each data set. So N1 here equals 12. And 2 also equals 12, and 3 equals 12, and N4 equals 12. Each data set has a size of 12. Um, this textbook we're, we're going to be using for this class, we're always going to have the same sample size. I will show you an example at the end of this uh, presentation. What happens if you have different sample sizes? It drastically complicates things uh, if you're doing the hand calculation big long formulas that you have to figure out. But in this class, we'll always keep them the same size. Let's find the mean of each of these samples. So the mean for the first sample is 290. All the other samples have 180.75. So you can see that first one for the small cars looks significantly larger. We'll see if that holds up. Standard deviation. Now this is for a sample, so we want stdev.s, sample standard deviation. Now remember, we said we have to have approximately the same standard deviation. Now these are quite different, ranging from 40 to 96, but they're not like way out there. I mean, 96 is a little bit more than double of 40, about two and a half times of 40. That sounds like it's a long ways away, but it's not. It's you know, we're within a factor, a multiple of five. That is close enough that we can go ahead and perform the ANOVA testing here. Let's check our requirements. So based on the the get what was given here, these are four populations that oh, they do appear to have normal distributions. We could graph each of them separately if we wanted to, to confirm that. Um, we could take each of these out and pull them out and do a normal quantile plot or a box plot to see if they're symmetrical and have no outliers. Um, I'll let you guys do that. We didn't show that here, but at this point, you guys are capable of seeing if they're approximately normally distributed. Obviously, in this class, all <laughs> <laughs> excuse me, all the examples and problems we give you, the populations are going to be approximately normally distributed. 
Otherwise, what's the point of having the problem? Our purpose is to go through the process. Second, the four samples have standard deviations that, like we can see here, they differ by a considerable amount, but they're not to they're not way out there. So we're gonna they're close enough that we can go ahead and do the process, do the test here. And on the basis of what was said in the study, we can treat them as simple random samples. They are independent of each other because there's no no overlap between them. It's either a small car, mid-sized car, large car, or SUV. There's none that are both. And we have four samples that are from different populations categorized by a single factor. The single factor is the vehicle size. So we've met that. So all of our requirements are satisfied. So then our null hypothesis is that the means are the same for all, are approximately the same for all four populations. The alternative is at least one of them is different. Now we should say here that at least one of them is different. It could be more. So at least one or more is different. But we can't say which one. We, all we can say is that there, at least one is different. Now we'll look at, there is a way that you can check to see which one or more is different. But for this test, um, we can't say which one is the one that's different or, or the other, maybe more than one that's different. So we could use Excel here for this test. Excel stat is really unnecessary because Excel has an add-in that does this really well. Um, doesn't require you to do a major add-in. So if you go to the data tab, on the right side here, very right side, you see this one here. This is the data analysis tool pack. If you click on that, yeah, single factor ANOVA is the very top. Make sure you scroll all the way up. You don't want ANOVA two-factor, you want single factor. So you can click OK. It's going to ask you where your data is. So we're going to clear that out. We're going to highlight our data. Now, notice I highlighted the titles up there. So this says labels in first row. I'm going to click on that to get rid of those labels, to tell the Excel that the first row is the labels, so they should ignore that. And then I want to tell it to put my output right here on the page, so I'm just going to click right there to say put the output there. Um, your default is going to say new worksheet ply. If you, use, if you leave it there, all it's going to happen is going to end up giving you a new worksheet with all your output on it, and you have to flip back and forth, so it's not a big deal. We're going to click OK to perform it, and here we get our information. So this right here is our test statistic. F is 7.69 in this case. This then is our p-value. So we have a p-value of 0 0.0003 is the p-value here. And this is telling us that's our critical value. So if our test statistic was bigger than 2.816, we would reject. So if we're looking at our curve here, this is obviously zero here. Um, this cutoff is 2.816. This area out here would be the alpha of 0.05. You'll notice in the settings we had alpha of 0.05 there. I go back to data, open this up. You can see I had alpha 0.05 right there. Um, our test statistic. of 7.68 is way out here. So we obviously reject the null hypothesis. Also, um, if we look at it, we see that our p-value is less than alpha. That p-value of 0 0.0003 is less than alpha. So we reject based on that as well. <clears throat> the rest of these numbers here are actually just parts of the calculation. Uh, we'll go over that in an example later on. So that's how we interpret this data here. This is our test statistic. This is our p-value. This is the critical value of the test statistic. 
Um, so we don't need the Excel stat output. It's all right there in just that standard uh, data analysis tool pack output. So in addition to the test statistic of F equals 7.685, we also get the p-value, which if we round it to three decimal places is 0.000. 1, 2, 3, the 3 would round it down to 0. Um, because the p-value is less than alpha of 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis. That means that at least one of the means is different. So our interpretation that the there is sufficient evidence to warrant rejection of the claim that the four, sam the four samples come from populations with equal means. That means at least one of the populations has a different mean based on this ANOVA test. We cannot, however, conclude which one is different. I mean, if we look at Excel display here, we can see the mean for... The small cars is the one that looks significantly different, but we cannot formally make that claim at this point of the ANOVA test. Um, all we can say is that it, it appears to be different, but we can conclusively say that at least one of them is different. We just can't say which one. So that is the caution. <coughs> the ANOVA test tells us that at least one of the means is different, but it does not definitively tell us which particular mean is different from the others. And it might be more than one of them that's different than the others. So a little bit of a summary here, just like we have with our other tests. Um, if the means are close to being the same, we're going to have a small test statistic and a very large p-value, which means we would fail to reject. If the means look to be quite different, we're going to have a large test statistic, which means a very small p-value, and there's a good chance we will reject the null hypothesis that the means are equal. So the test statistic for the for this comes from a ratio. As I said, there's two numbers that come in. First is the variance between samples. And then we have the variance within the samples. So the variance between samples is actually the standard deviation of the sample means. The variance within the samples is the mean of the standard of the sample standard deviations. Um, and of course, it can, it's a weighted mean and a weighted standard deviation. If the sample sizes are different, this gets to be a complicated process. But we're going to look at what if they aren't different? What if they are about the same? So I want to calculate that F if the sample sizes are equal, if they're all the same size or N. Then it's not so bad to calculate. So back here, looking at this. Um, so we have two situations here. The first situation is this one here on the left. We have these three samples. Samples one, two, and three. You can see that all of them have four items. So N1 is four, N2 is four, N3 is four. Being the same size makes the rest of this easier. They have a mean of 5.5, 6.0, and 6.0. If I find the standard deviation of those means, we will go to a separate page here. 5.5, 6.0, and 6.0. The standard deviation is 0.28865. Now remember, we don't need that. We're not comparing the standard deviations. It's actually the variances. The variance is that standard deviation squared. We have 0 0.08333. You'll see here, that's the number we get right down here. So four times that gives us the standard deviation between the means. So 0.3332 is the standard or the variance of the means that goes on top of our test statistic on the bottom of our test statistic is the mean of the variances 
So this 3 here is not the standard deviation. It's the standard deviation squared. So we got 3, 2, and 2. We add them together and divide by 3 to get the mean of the variances is 2.33. That is our number that goes on the bottom of our test statistic down here. We divide those out. We get our test statistic of 0.1428. That's going to have a very high p-value. So how would I find the p-value of that if I wasn't... Uh, if I didn't have it given to me there. So that test statistic of 0.1428. I'm just going to type it in here so I don't forget the number. Equals F distribution right here. And we want right tail. X is this value right here. Degrees of freedom in the numerator is the number of samples minus one. So there's three samples here, minus one makes that two. The degrees of freedom in the denominator is the total items in all of the samples. So there's four in each sample. So four times three is 12, minus the number of samples. So there's three samples, so 12 minus three is nine. Gives the degrees of freedom there. So that gives us a point eight six eight eight. It's exactly what we had right here. 0.8688. Now, if I wanted to find the critical value of F for this, there's an F inverse here. I want the F inverse right tail. Probability of 0.05. Degrees of freedom in the numerator is still 2, and denominator is still 9. We get 4.25 would be, 256 would be our critical value. Now let's step back. Actually, since we're on this, let's step back here to this display here. How would I have found my critical value of the 2.816 here? Now this had four data sets. So my degrees of freedom in my numerator is 4 minus 1, which would be 3. Now, capital N is 48 total numbers here. There's 12 in each set times 4 is 48. So the degrees of freedom in the numerator is capital N minus K, which is the number of data sets. So that's 48 minus 4 is going to be 44. So I have degrees of freedom of 3 and 44. I'm going to go back to this page to find this. So it equals F inverse, right tail. Of 0 0.05, 3, and 44. And there I get the 2.816, just as it shows right here, was my critical value. So anyway, back down to this example. In this second example over here that I'm going to circle in green, what we did was we changed the first sample by adding 10 to each of them. Now that does not change the variance. The standard deviation and variance stay the same. It just increases the mean by 10. So instead of 5.5, it's 15.5. So now the standard deviation of the means, or the variance of the means, I should say, is 30.083. Let's double check that so you can see where that comes from. So now I have 15.5. Six and six are my sample means. So... Sample standard deviation is 5.48. So we're going to take that squared to get the variance, 30.0833. So that's what we got down here. And then we multiply that by 4 to get the, and again, 4 is the sample size of each sample. To get the 120.3332, that's our top number down here. The bottom number is still the same. Our variances are still the same. So we get the 2.33. We divide to get 51.5721, calculating a p-value of 0 .0000118. <coughs> Let's double check that p-value. So what was that? 51.5721. I'm just going to type that in here. So let's equal our F distribution, right tail, for that value, um, 
two degrees of freedom and nine in the numerator, just like we had before. So there was, there was three data sets, so three minus one is two. There were 12 total data points for three data sets, so 12 minus three gives us the nine again. And there we get the point, so that's in um, scientific notation, that's point zero 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 one one eight which is what they're selling right here. Now the whole point of this example is just to show you that we change the size of one sample, the standard deviation does, doesn't change. Um, the variance doesn't change. We increased each of these by 10, the variance stayed the same. It was the mean that changed. And the test statistic here is very sensitive to differences in the mean. So that's why we use this to test to see if multiple, multiple populations have approximately equal means. And that's all they're saying here is because they're sensitive to, oops, actually talking about the critical values, the numerator critical value, or numerator degrees of freedom, I should say, is k minus one. Remember, k is the number of data sets, number of samples. And then the denominator degree of freedom, they're wording this a little different. It's k times n minus one. That's if they're all the same size. Otherwise, it's just capital N, which is the total number of items in all the data sets, minus K, which is the number of data sets. For this case, it'll give you the same value. It's just this one only works if all the data sets are the same size. And this is saying we can see here that this test, we got the three samples that are identical. Um, except for the mean and, and has been increased by 10 in the second one. Um, but the test statistic changed drastically because of that change in the mean, showing us that we are sensitive to those changes in the mean. So that gave us a value, it took us from something that was not significant. That left, that left side here was a very small test statistic and a very large p-value. So we would not have rejected the null hypothesis there to where the right side gave us a very significant result. This was a large test statistic and very small p-value. So we would have rejected the null hypothesis there um, and concluded that at least one of those means was different. And again, we see here that the variance between the samples didn't change. It was the difference, the, the variance of the mean, the change in the means is what caused the, the big difference. So we have, um, it's called within treatments variance and between treatments variance. So the change in the mean changes the between treatments um, variance. The variance itself is the within treatments variances that do not change. So again, this is just repeating. The F statistics, the F test, is very sensitive to changes in the mean. That's why we use it here. Um, now, they, they mentioned there's a table. If we go to the book, like we said, you got to be careful to make sure you get the F distribution table that is for alpha equals 0 0.05. And the degrees of freedom in the numerator. So let's go back to the example where we had the critical value here, this one right here. We said our degrees of freedom in the numerator were 3, and in the denominator were 44. And this is an alpha of 0 0.05. So three up here. Oops, this won't let me highlight that for some reason. Um, so we're going to be in this third column. But if we go down, there is no 44. We've got 40 or 60. So we look over. All we can tell here is that the critical value is somewhere between 2.8387 and 2.7518. We can't get that exact number. We were able to get that from Excel. We saw that here. We put in equals F inverse, right tail. Put in alpha of 0 0.05. The numerator had three degrees of freedom. The denominator had 44. Oops, not 4, 40, 44. We have the 2.816 is our critical value. So the table can only give us an approximate, criti approxi approximate critical value unless we happen to fall right on one of those. If we have smaller data sets, of course, you know, up to 30 total, 
we, we have all those numbers out there. But when we have multiple data sets, you know, three or four data sets, all of them would have to be pretty small to keep the total under 30. So chances are we're going to have to use approximate numbers for that critical value if we use the table. So that's where technology and Excel come in and help us out. Now, I haven't shown you StatCrunch yet, so let's do that right now. So I loaded this data into StatCrunch. I'm going to go to Stat and ANOVA, one way. And it's going to ask me, you know, is the data separated by columns? Um, StatCrunch will only accept it if it's separated by columns. So I'm going to just go here. And what I do is you hold down the Shift key and you select. So all four of those columns are going to be used. So you select, make sure all of them are highlighted. All four of them show up over here on the right. Um, where we put it, it's just going to pop up in a new window. Now this is Compute the Tukey HSD. Um, Tukey is a short term. It's actually the Tukey Kramer. Um, it's called a, a, basically it's a confidence interval showing us which one's different. Now I'm going to go ahead and click on that. And I'll show you what that tells us. So we click OK here, and it calculates for each sample, calculate the mean standard deviation, the standard error if we want it. And it gives us the same display here, or similar display here as what we had in Excel, only it doesn't give us the critical value because I didn't click that, that indicator in the box. Um, but it gives us the same test statistic here of 7.685, same p-value of 0 0.0003. Down below here, it gives us the two key Kramer intervals. So it, this starts out, this is comparing variable one to the other three variables. And so this line here is the interval, the confidence interval between, the, and it's not a regular confidence interval, it's the two key Kramer confidence interval between variable one and variable two. Now, if the, the interval starts out negative and goes positive, that means the two variables are approximately equal. Well, here it starts out negative and stays negative. The upper limit is also negative. So that's saying variable one is probably different from variable two. This one then is comparing variable three to variable one. Remember, everything's being compared to variable one in this first table. Again, it starts out negative and stays negative. So it's saying variable three is different from variable one. Then this row compares variable four. Again, lower limit's negative and the upper limit's negative. So it's saying variable four is different from variable one. What that's telling us right now is variable one is different from all of the other three. This down here is moving on to variable two. Now, since variable two has already been compared to variable one up here, we don't need to do it again. So we'll just compare it to variable three. This interval goes from negative in the lower limit to positive in the upper limit. In other words, it contains zero. So variable three and variable two are approximately equal. This compares variable four to variable two. Again, this contains zero. It starts out negative and goes to positive. So variable four is approximately equal to variable two. And then this final table is for variable three. We've already compared it to variables one and two in these other tables. So we only need to compare it to variable four. And once again, that interval starts out negative and goes positive, which means it contains zero. So variable four and variable three are approximately equal. So what this all is telling us down here, this two key, again, it's technically a two key Kramer analysis, is that variable one is the one that's different. Now, um, there's a lot going on there. Uh, what I want to show you now is in one of your homework problems. Now, I'm not going to make you do that Tukey Kramer analysis, by the way. Um, but anyway, in one of your homework problems, there is a kind of a tricky uh, situation. Let me pull it up here. I'm just going to preview this. And it's actually homework problem number five. Now, I can do this because the numbers, these are um, algorithmic questions, so the numbers you get will be slightly different from mine. So this is asking, if we're doing an analysis of variance test here, what's the null hypothesis? Well, the null hypothesis is always going to be that the means are equal. The alternative is at least one is different. Now, it wants us to do the test statistic. 
So if I do this, I click on, now there's this little thing up here, This it's a clipboard of the data. I have to open my data. Here's my data set. Now it's showing for mile one, these are the times. This top row is the times for mile one. It's in minutes and seconds. That's three minutes, 16 seconds. Well, if I copy this over to any of my other items, it's not gonna copy well. So I'm gonna open this, I'm gonna copy this in the clipboard and it's gonna give me this. Now I have to make sure I copy this. I'm gonna right click and hit copy there to make sure that's copy. If I go to Excel and I paste, um, this does not make any sense. So these two lines here both represent mile one. This is three minutes and 16 seconds for the first shot, three minutes, 25 seconds for the second shot. Now the thing is both Excel and StatCrunch think in columns. So I, first of all, I have to change this all into seconds, and then I have to arrange it in columns. These numbers have to be put into a column. So column one is mile one. The first time of three minutes, 16 seconds, well, three times 60 is 180, plus 16 is 196. Three minutes, 25 seconds is 205 seconds. 324 is 204, 323 is 203 and 322 is 202. That's mile one, that's this data right here. Then mile two is the next two lines. Um, this is three minutes, 18 seconds, which is 198. Three minutes, 23, 203, 201, 197, and 198. And then mile three, are these bottom two rows? This is three minutes, 33 seconds. That's 213 seconds. 210, 208, 212, and 208. So now we're gonna do the test that these are approximately equal. So I'm gonna highlight it. I go to data. I click on this tool pack up here, single factor ANOVA. Okay, I'm gonna slide it out of the way so that I can select my data is here. Notice I had to delete that out. My output range, I'm gonna delete that and we'll put it down here and we'll hit okay. So there we get a test stat F of 21.88. Enter that and make sure it's right. So done, I've already copied that data over. 21.88 and it tells us, oops, Something did not like that, did I? <clears throat> so a good chance I typed in one number incorrectly there. I'm just going to, oops, that's not what I wanted. Just in case there's a rounding difference, nope. I should double check my data. So I did have one number miskeyed. I had this in as 202 instead of 203. So let's delete this out and do that all again. So I select my ANOVA single factor and everything's already set. So I'm just hit okay, It'll overwrite it. And there I get 19.86, let's see if that is better. And it is. P-value, well the P-value there you can see is 0 .000, rounded to three decimal places. So I enter it in, 0 .000, that's good. Now I was gonna ask, what is our conclusion? Well, we reject it because the P-value is less than alpha. This one says there's insufficient evidence to warrant rejection. That's not true. That there is sufficient evidence. That's the one we want. And then now we need to interpret that result. Does one mile appear, does one of the miles appear to have a hill? And the answer is no, the data do not suggest that any of the miles have a hill. There's no difference in between them. Oops. Sorry, we rejected the null hypothesis, so I should go back here and 
look at these, it does, since we rejected it, it does suggest that one mile is different. So I should find the mean for each of them. Now again, technically we really can't say which mile is different, but here it looks like this mile goes quite a bit slower in mile three. Um, mile two goes the fastest. So we can say that, suggest that the third mile, the first mile, So it suggests that the third mile appears to take longer. And this, the first mile also appears to take longer. So let's see if it accepts that. Oops, not saying that. So just the third mile. So you can see there's a little bit of a subjectiveness there because both the first and third mile take longer, but the third mile took a lot longer. So it's asking the third mile appears to have something going on. Um, now, realistically, if you're biking three miles, it's logical that the third mile might go slower because you might be tired. Um, so there's, it might not necessarily say that mean that there's a hill here. It might be other factors, but we can say that the third mile, the time for the third mile is definitely different from the other, other miles. So I just wanted to point that out to you. That it's a little tricky that you have to rearrange that data from being minutes and seconds like this to being all seconds. And you have to rearrange it from being in rows to being in columns. So as you're going through this, if you're downloading that data directly from uh, my math lab, again, the way you do it is you click on it. You click this little thing, this little double window here to copy. And I think it's easy to copy it to the clipboard. Even if you're gonna use stat crunch instead of Excel, it's still easier to just copy it into the clipboard and then clipboard and then copy and paste it from there. So remember from here, you first have to copy it. Just because you hit copy doesn't mean it's copied yet. It's highlighted. You right click to copy it. Then you go and paste it wherever you need it. So there we go. Okay. Um, as promised, I said I would show you what happens if you have different sample sizes. Well, there are ugly formulas. So from population one, population two, and population three, we have sample sizes of N1, N2, and N3. We have means of X bar one, X bar two and X bar three, and standard deviations of S1, S2, and S3. So the formula that we're gonna use for the numerator of our test statistic is N1 times X bar one minus GM. Now GM is the grand mean. So I should find GM up here first. GM is equal to N1 times X bar 1 plus N2 times X bar 2 plus N3 times X bar 3 all over N1 plus N2 plus N3. It is the weighted mean of the means. So that's where the grand mean comes in. That difference is squared. Plus N2 times, so I didn't subscript this real well, times X bar 2 minus the grand mean squared on up to however many we have. In this case, it's only three, so we'd stop at the next term. And then you're going to divide all of that by... K minus one, where K again is the number of samples. So up here, K equals three because we're looking at one, two, three populations. Then the denominator of our F statistic, the formula would be 
n1 minus 1 times s1 squared plus n2 minus 1 times s2 squared plus adding up however many they are. And this is all going to be divided by, remember, capital N is this all of the sample sizes added together minus k, which is the number of samples. And then, of course, to get your F statistic, you take this top number divided by this bottom number. That gives you F, the test statistic. Big loan formulas, a lot of calculation there. And in this class, we're not going to have to do those formulas. Um, we're going to rely on the technology, either Excel or StatCrunch. Um, I am never going to formally ask. I'm never going to ask you to do the formal Tukey Kramer analysis like I did. Let's see the right mouse. Like I did in the Stack Crunch version here, where we had that window pop up. Let me show you that again. <coughs> Hold down the Shift key to highlight all those. This is the Tukey Kramer analysis that I brought up here. So you go down here, it doesn't give me an option for the critical value on this one. So I'm never going to ask you to come down here and actually look at these formal confidence intervals to try to figure out which one of the populations is different. Again, if we fail to reject the, the null hypothesis, we don't need to do this because we're saying all the populations are approximately the same. Um, but if we reject the null hypothesis, this tells us which one's different. I'm never going to ask you to do that formal analysis. Um, the most I would ask you to do is to look, if you have the means, calculate the means in Excel like this, and tell me which one looks to be more different from the others. Of course, that is, in this case, was the small cars, was more different. Okay, so that is a NOVA testing. There's a lot to do there, a lot to understand. And that's why there's only a few problems in the homework. Uh, this display is what tells us everything we need to know, so... Make sure you have that. If you do not have, if you go to the data screen and you do not have this little icon up here that indicates the data analysis tool pack, you might have to go to add-ins. So you go to the home screen and you can click on add-ins and you'll have to then select, again, I'm adding add-ins here is tough to do. Um, the data analysis tool pack is a standard add-in we use in our package, but I can't put other add-ins in here. Um, so you would have to go to, you would have lists here that would show data analysis tool pack. There's actually two that are labeled data analysis tool pack. Add them both in so you get the full functionality. Um, and it'll give you that option then when you go to data, then this would appear. If it's grayed out, so when you point at it, it doesn't highlight like that, that means you haven't installed it yet. So you'd have to go through and do that process to install it. Okay, so that wraps up the course. It's been a great semester working with all of you. Um, hope you've learned a lot. If you need anything, please let me know. Even after the course, if you encounter stuff, um, feel free to get in touch, and I'll be happy to help you out. Like I said, it's been a great semester. You guys have a great summer, and good luck in all your other classes.